get a little bit uh, clearing now on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. As usual, we are here with our astronomer, Marley, who is just a few doors down from me. Hello, Marley. How's it going? It's good. I'm glad that it's not raining anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had cloudy skies for our observatory night uh, last night, but hopefully uh, Friday night, uh, lots of people have been asking about that green comet that's been coming by. Um, so if you're out there and want to come down to our observatory, you probably can't see it through the telescope, uh, but come on down because we'll hopefully be able to see something uh, tomorrow night because we're open up the observatory on Friday nights. Uh, but for this show, uh, we are celebrating, uh, if you can call it that, Space Debris Day. Uh, so we've got uh, two special guests that are going to give their perspectives. Um, and we're going to start off with uh, Dr. Aaron Rosengren, who uh, uh, celebrated with us, was it like five or six years ago now, Aaron? Um, uh, you came to us with this idea to celebrate Space Debris Day, is that right? Yeah, it was five five years ago. 2019 was the 10-year anniversary of the, uh, the one collision that occurred in space between two intact satellites and sort of uh, raise the awareness uh, of that the collisions in space, despite how big it is, can can occur and then can sort of uh, peripherate space debris throughout. So it can be a real hazard. Yeah, wonderful. And you are the assistant professor now at the Jacobs School of Engineering and the Center for Astrophysics and Space Studies at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, if you want to share your screen, why don't you maybe share with the audience uh, what you're uh, working on in relation to uh, the topic today? Sure. Um, how is this showing up here? Yeah, look, looks good. Yeah, so um, most of my research thrust has actually been in the, uh, for the last decade or so, have been in the sort of traditional area uh, uh, zones that we orbit from, from low altitude uh, to, to the geosynchronous regime. Um, and, and this is where, you know, most of our, our satellites and debris are, are located. So we we have about um, currently tracked twenty six thousand or so in the in the the public catalog uh, of objects, mostly in low Earth orbit, but uh, Geo is also pretty uh, populated. And and these are the re regimes where we we care traditionally most about space surveillance and 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 uh, the notion of of sort of uh, safeguarding safe space operations, because as we know, we we depend a lot on 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 space for for many many aspects of our lives. Um, most of my research. Nowadays, though, has focused a little bit beyond the geosynchronous region into the cislunar space between the Earth and the Moon. Uh, now, this is a dynamically quite different regime. Things don't sort of orbit in our, you know, nice geometrical ellipses and circles that, that we think about as an as a orbiting satellite. But now we have this regime of the Lagrange points and, and where, where the gravity of the Earth and the Moon are sort of balanced. And we can get all kinds of different interesting types of motions. Um, and so my, my, my current work and research thrust, also given the large distance and, and sort of the bright moon right there in front uh, of where we're sort of putting uh, our satellites or, or maybe maybe behind it, illuminating them, uh, is that uh, most of my research thrust now are on trying to characterize and, and safeguard uh, our operations in this more distant region that's about a thousand times uh, volumetric space than, than we've dealt with in the past. Yeah, interesting. Now, is the reason for this because we are now moving towards like the Lunar Gateway is sort of stretching out where um, our uh, space bases are going to be? And of course, you know, JWST is in that uh, Lagrange point. Is that sort of like the impetus for you shifting your research more to this area? Yeah, so, so the James Webb uh, is in is in the uh, the Earth's sun um, and uh, the the gateway is going is, is actually in, in L1, as you can see in this, this figure here. Um, so that that's the impetus. Most you know, most of the uh, thrust now of the Air Force and Space Force and NASA have been pushed out to this new sort of operational zone uh, of of distant space. So it's it's sort of sort of you know, there's a number of nations, about twenty different nations, with activities now um, pushing in that that regime. So it's better to to sort of understand the totality of uh, sort of the motions that can occur, so that if we have a breakup event. Um, and, and we can characterize what happens to the debris there and awesome. not create a, a debris field around the moon, let's say, where we don't have a, a very tenuous atmosphere. Right, exactly. So we're going to get uh, the movie Gravity, but it's going to be the, the moon and not uh, not the Earth, right? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> I can't help but uh, see you've got um, you got something there uh, in the bottom right of your uh, diagram, the cone of shame. It looks like the, the moon is in the cone of shame. Uh, what exactly is going on there? 
Yeah, I think that was a moniker given by the uh, the Air Force Research Laboratory. Um, basically, if you, most of the objects, the uh, orbits that we care about in Cislunar today are these things called vibration point orbits. So instead of, you, you know, you think about dropping a rock on the surface of the Earth, right, it falls down to the Earth. If, you, if you're launching a satellite into a low Earth orbit, it re still revolves around the Earth, similar to the moon. Now, if you drop something in space at that Earth-Moon L1 point, uh, now we can have a completely different types of, of, of motions. And then some of them that we really care about are really where they're periodic so that they, they sort of orbit this, this point in space. Uh, but this is in a rotating frame. And so really that point always tracks the moon. So if you trying to use your ground-based optical um, uh, telescopes uh, to, to um, detect objects there, you have this very bright moon behind you. So they call it the cone of shame because it, it can it can complicate space surveillance. Uh, and then it's really where, um, you know, maneuverability is, is, uh, is pretty easy to do and it's at a low cost. You can go between the different Lagrange points with um, very minute sort of uh, uh, thrusting burns. So and it's a region that the, the Air Force and the Space Force is very concerned about in terms yeah. of how do we, how do we, uh, Patrol it as you see the Susan or Highway Patrol system. Awesome. And well, now the moon has something in common, you know, with with our dogs that you know get a little bit of surgery and they got to get that cone on there. Uh, maybe even a cat or, or or a rabbit. You know, it is it is the year of the cat uh, in some uh, some countries this year. So so there you go. Thank you so much, Aaron, for uh, being here for another uh, space debris day. Um, so Marley, before we go to our our main special guest for today, uh, why don't you give us some context? So we say the space debris day is a specific day, which should be tomorrow, February tenth. Uh, what happened on February? 10th. So happy to have guests because I get to share my one. <laughs> oh, Marley, I think you may have muted yourself there. Am I back? You're back, yeah. Okay, there we go. So what happened on February 10th? Am I still sharing my screen or did it stop? No, I think it stopped. Oh my goodness, everything's breaking. See one slide, but then everything breaks. <laughs> okay, on February 10th, uh, what ended up happening was these two satellites that you'll see in just a second um, hit each other. And that was something that hadn't happened before uh, up until kind of that point, at least not one that large. So these two satellites, the Iridium 33 satellite, which was an active uh, communication satellite, uh, collided with a like defunct or no longer in operation uh, Cosmos uh, 2251 satellite that was owned by uh, Russia. And it was no longer being used. It was just up there as like a dead satellite. Uh, and they collided with each other and caused, as of 2011 was the last number I could find, 2,000 large pieces of space debris. So it was quite a large collision that ended up having quite the domino ricochet effect for everything. Like the International Space Station has had to move itself to avoid remaining debris from this collision. So it has been quite uh, the trickle down effect since this collision. And that's why February 10th was picked because this was kind of like the big event that caused that caused everything to kind of be reevaluated and had us thinking as Aaron said, like, what are we doing with everything that's left up there? Like things will, if we're not watching, things will eventually hit. Yeah, yeah. And so of course that was 2009. So uh, we have been doing this event every year since and every year um, it gets a little bit more information and it gets a little bit more complicated. And so that's why we have brought in today's uh, special guest, uh, Dr. Alyssa Mattis, who is the radar and optical measurements lead in the NASA Orbital Debris Program Office. Uh, welcome, Alyssa. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Michael. Thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and so you, uh, this office, the NASA Orbital Debris Office, it is located in uh, Houston, is that correct? That's correct, NASA Johnson Space Center. Wonderful. Well, uh, Alyssa, so uh, why don't you start us off and get into a little bit of what you do there and what the, what the office does and kind of like framing what we're talking about today, Space Debris Day. Sure, absolutely. So as you said, I am the Radar and Optical Measurements Lead, um, and I help with integrating our measurements into orbital debris models. So the, the main task of our office is really characterizing and modeling the orbital debris environment. So giving an idea of what is out there. And of course, there are a lot of objects that are tracked and cataloged. And we really focus on 
what is not tracked and what is not cataloged, because those are the smaller objects that can be very dangerous because they are not tracked. Um, so mm -hmm. we don't necessarily know they're out there, but they are large enough to cause major damage to operational um, spacecraft and upper stages. So that's really where we focus on. Yeah, and when you say small object, like give us like, could you give us like a size? Like how small are we talking? Sure. So the, the catalog is considered complete down to about 10 centimeters in low Earth orbit, about one meter in geosynchronous orbit. Um, and so we really focus on smaller than that. So 10 centimeters and below. And in particular, uh, debris in the millimeter size range is really considered the largest mission ending risk to operational spacecraft because, uh, because again, it's, it's untracked. It's difficult to see with ground based sensors and it can really destroy a satellite and, and cause uh, the end of a mission. Mm, interesting. Uh, so why don't you get into the main topic? You've, uh, you, you're doing some uh, uh, great work there in the office. Why don't you share some of the, the work that you're doing? Sure. So let me pull up my slides um, and make sure that this works as well as it did earlier. Um, looks like it's up. Can, mm -hmm. yeah. can you all see this? Okay. Great. So um, I will focus today kind of, again, on that, that integration of the measurements and the modeling. We take uh, measurements from ground-based uh, radars and, and telescopes, and how do we integrate those into the models? And in particular today, I'll focus on optical measurements and how we use those to characterize the orbital debris environment in geosynchronous orbit. So a um, little bit of background on our models, uh, in particular, our orbital debris engineering model, that's the main product from our office, and go into a little bit of details of how we actually built and validated the geo population for Ordem 3.1, which was previously the most recent um, version of the model. We actually have Ordem 3.2 out now, which was prompted by the uh, Russian anti-satellite test against um, Cosmos 1408. And so we, we incorporated that population. And so that's just an example of how we sometimes update this model in response to um, events in the environment. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some other sensors that we have coming online and that we will be using in the future. So a bit of background on Ordem itself. Ordem is an engineering model. Um, so it's designed for uh, typically and primarily for satellite owners and operators so that they know what they're up against, basically. What kind of environment are they going to be operating in and risks to their vehicles from orbital debris impacts? And in, in particular, the model focuses on debris size, material density, and orbits, basically, impact speed and direction relative to uh, a satellite. Um, the, the risk that's computed by this orbital debris model is, is different than that for uh, conjunction assessments. So conjunction assessments are really focused on the short-term risk, making sure that you know, there's uh, enough distance or not, you know, maneuvers uh, may happen. ORDEM is focused on the long-term impact. So looking at the debris averaged over the course of a year and then over time. And again, as I talked about earlier, we're really focused on objects that are too small to be tracked. And the mission ending risk, again, is really dominated by those small untracked debris, particularly in the millimeter size range. The orbital debris environment is dynamic, as we've seen a lot of changes have happened just in the past few years, um, which prompted uh, this series of presentations, um, Space Debris Day. So we update ORDEM periodically um, to go with the, the changes that we're seeing in the environment. Um, sources that we use for ORDEM, um, in particular for the geo environment, optical sources, again, the catalog, which I mentioned is complete down to approximately 10, centimeter, 10 centimeters in LEO and about one meter in geo. And to supplement that for the smaller sizes, historically we've used uh, MODEST, the Michigan Orbital Debris Survey Telescope. And that provides us a statistical assessment, meaning the telescope doesn't necessarily track objects. It points, it looks, debris flies through the field of view, and we collect those measurements in a statistical sense and use those to, to build up our models. Um, a little bit of background on MODEST, it's a 0.6 meter telescope laid, located at the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile. It was the primary source for NASA from 2001 to 2014. And we have, uh, as I'll talk about later, we have some new sensors that are online now. 
The data is correlated with the SSN catalog, so that helps us determine if the detections are of um, cataloged objects, correlated targets, or uncorrelated targets. And the uncorrelated targets are really the ones that we're interested in. Those are most likely to be debris, and those are the ones that we really care about when it comes to building the models. Because the, the arc, um, the, the observation arc that we get is relatively short, so we have to assume a circular orbit. Um, so again, for Ortom itself, we, we really need the size, we need the orbits. Um, we don't get those measurements directly from, uh, from, our uh, from the, the telescope or other sensors that we use. We get uh, magnitude, which we can convert to a size, and we get some information about the orbit, but we have to use some assumptions when building these models. For ORDEM 3.1, we had a couple of different data sets that we used for building and validating um, just to make sure that the data that we build is still uh, representative of the environment when we look at other um, data sources. Um, here, quickly, just a brief overview of data coverage for ORDEM. There's a lot of different sensors, a lot of different uh, measurements that we pull in, and again, for this, for this talk, I'll be talking about you know, the higher altitude stuff, the geo stuff um, that's modest, and then ESMCAT, which I'll talk about. Um, here's a, a magnitude distribution that we have from modest and just pointing out kind of where the different objects fit in terms of absolute magnitude. So there, um, towards the left, you have the functional CTs. Those are the correlated ta targets, the intact objects. Um, and then non-functional ones, those are the, the derelict ones that are floating around like um, Cosmos 2251 perhaps. And then towards the right, the larger magnitudes, the bright, or sorry, the dimmer magnitudes, those are the debris. And the roll off that we see is not necessarily a true roll off, that's the detection capability. And so we use some modeling uh, techniques to help um, extend those into the, the smaller sizes and the, the dimmer magnitudes from there. So one of the things that we did for ORDEM 3.1 is we wanted to pull out the detections that were most likely debris. And again, those are uncorrelated targets. But even beyond that, um, some of those uncorrelated targets may actually be non-geo objects. They may be um, objects that are in um, geotransfer orbits. And again, because of the short time arc for the observations, we have to make a circular orbit assumption. So we wanted to figure out a way, can we get away from that? Can we make a more um, realistic and characteristic orbit for these, uh, for these objects? And we know that uncontrolled objects in GEO naturally process in inclination and in, in right ascension space due to Earth's oblateness and effects from gravity from the, the moon and the sun. And what this ends up is a, a loop in the Cartesian coordinates of inclination times cosine of right ascension, the ascending node, and inclination times sine of right ascension and the ascending node. And so that's kind of our phase space that we have to work with in GEO. And we see that um, controlled and intact objects clump around 0, 0 in this space. And the, uh, the debris and the derelict satellites spread out. And we use that information to look at the, the angle between an object's orbit, the stable Laplace plane, and identify objects within a, a debris ring. And so pictures are, are better than words. So here's what that looks like in our um, phase space of interest. And all of the black dots are our modest detections. The circles, the orange circles there are our debris ring limits. And so we use that to basically stamp out those detections that we were most interested in in terms of building up our statistical geo model. And some of the, the geo um, breakups that have happened, all of those are accidental explosions. Um, some of those are listed there, a few Ekrons and a Titan 3C uh, trans stage. And we can see those in the detections that we get. So again, I mentioned we have to assume a circular orbit, but this is kind of where the, the measurements and the modeling art comes in again, where we can use some information from modeled geo breakups to inform what kind of orbits we should be seeing. And we can bring in that information to get rid of this circular orbit assumption and come up with more realistic orbits. And so we use the NASA standard satellite breakup model to inform, um, inform how we can do that for the measurements. And then I talked about validation. We had a separate data set from MODEST that we used to, once we built the population uh, in GEO, 
we compared that to a separate data set from Modest to see how well we did. Um, is the model that we built still representative of the environment looking at it from a different perspective, basically? And what we found actually was that the separate data set had more detections in, in some areas. And we looked in particular at what we call a clock angle. So again, in that phase space of inclination uh, cosine ran and inclination sine ran, we define the clock angle as, as the angle around the clock, basically, in that, in that phase space. And looking at the distribution in clock angle, we saw some regions where um, the data was telling us that there was more there than we were seeing in the models. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, what we said was wrong. It just means that there's more information that the measurements are giving us. And we can incorporate that um, by, by making some adjustments and fine tuning the model. And we suspect that um, in particular in GEO, it's hard to identify breakups. Um, they are they're, they're high altitude. It's difficult to observe them. Um, they move slowly. So it, sometime, it's not unheard of to have these geo breakups that are not identified until years, decades after they happen. And so uh, we actually inserted some simulated breakups to bump up our model so that it better matched the data. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, that was all data using Modest. Moving forward, we have a, a new asset, the Eugene Stansbury Meter Class Autonomous Telescope that will be, will be providing our measurements for the geo environment for ORDEM 4.0 and beyond. Um, it is a 1.3 meter telescope manufactured by DFM. Um, there's some details there that I won't go over necessarily, but just to say it is on Ascension Island, which is uh, near equatorial and in the middle of the Atlantic, very remote location. It's a joint project with AFRL, and its location was chosen specifically so that it could give us coverage over basically all altitudes of interest. It can go from low inclination LEO to GEO, covers GEO transfer orbits. We can potentially even use it for some lunar observations, and um, it's, it's a really great asset for us going forward. A few milestones. It, Originally, the concept was developed in, uh, you know, two decades ago. Uh, groundbreaking was in 2014. It re uh, achieved FOC in September of 2021. And as of last year, early last year, it completed its first geo survey um, that we are now analyzing the data from to incorporate into the next version of ORDEM. And again, a lot of details here that I won't go into, but um, some pictures just to show you the, the bottom left there is what the geo belt looks like from Ascension Island. Um, the green squares are the field center, so where we look every night. The purple is the Earth shadow, so we try to look before and after Earth shadow each night. And um, basically, we want to provide good coverage over the geo belt where we know that there are uh, most likely debris objects. And then on the right is, again, that inclination cosine ran, inclination sine ran space. And the, the colors there are indicative of what, um, what we term an expectation value. So we want to have coverage over that region of interest of about 30% or higher over our geo survey period. And so that's what the, the different colors represent. And if you can see, there are some pink and some gray dots that are probably very um, small. And those are our modeled uh, population. And so again, using the modeled information to inform the measurements where we should be looking, and then we'll pull those measurements in to, again, update the model going forward. Uh, here's some examples of just what we got from M ESMCAT's first geo survey. On the left is the coverage that we actually got. So the previous slide was the, the predicted coverage where we wanted to look to make sure that we were looking in all of the right places uh, over GEO. And so this is where we actually did look. And um, just because of some um, circumstances with COVID, um, that prevented us from traveling to do facility maintenance and cleaning of the mirror and all of these things that we have to do. We actually had some degradation of the mirror over that time. And so we, um, by the end of that time period, uh, we had to, remove the mirror and get it recoded and it has since been um, reinstalled and has the best limiting magnitudes that we've actually seen from from that telescope. So it, it's very exciting. 
and um, the, the plots here on the right, the middle and the right are the, the detections that we had for correlated targets and uncorrelated targets. And um, I think that, that basically wraps up. So again, probably went through that really quickly, but just a kind of an overview of how we, how we use these measurements. It's great to take these optical measurements and then what do we do with them? How do we get them into the models? So. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Alyssa. This was uh, fantastic uh, to hear. Uh, some, someone from NASA, you know, uh, we only got about four minutes left in the show. Um, you know, one thing that I'm really curious about, you know, when Aaron came to us, you know, about five or six years ago to talk about Space Debris Day, you know, this was something that, you know, seemed very sort of like far-fetching. But then, of course, like every year, it seems to be like more and more sort of like serious. And it's, it is nice to see sort of like that this type of work is being done. From your perspective, you know, maybe you could like tell us like, like how much bigger is like, are like these, um, is the work being done? Like is, are more countries now taking it seriously? Um, is NASA itself, you know, putting more money into sort of like really looking at the, the problems? Like what's, you can give us like a broad overview of how that's growing. Sure. It, it's definitely something that we're seeing increased interest in just from, you know, the US government has, has the topic of orbital debris is now being addressed at yeah. you know, government levels um, here in the US and elsewhere. Many other countries have initiatives to, um, you know, to, to do whatever they can to, you know, maybe they're trying to look into technologies for cleaning up space. Maybe they're looking into um, mitigation. We folk, our office, we focus on mitigation, sort of the idea of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure type thing and looking at, at preventing the environment from getting um, worse. And um, we, there are international organizations that are really focused on on this effort. So the, the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee for one uh, is a group of um, right now, I believe 13 member agencies um, and, and countries that are all working together to try to address this problem. Um, and the, the pace is definitely picking up, I think, and making sure that we're, we're doing what we can to, um, again, prevent these prevent these accidental um, collisions and explosions from happening and making sure that missions are still able to operate as they, as they need to, you know, we need this technology, we need these satellites, we need the communications and the other services that they provide. And how do we do that in a safe way? Yeah. Interesting. Aaron, did you want to uh, jump in here? Of course, you've been um, looking at this, you know, uh, with your research. Um, how does, how do you kind of like connect to what like NASA does and like what, and what their um, observations, like, do you use their observations? Do you share? Um, maybe give some context there. Yeah, sure. So, so we, we don't have, you know, um, direct access to NASA's observations, but some of them are, are, are given to, you know, the, the Air Force, uh, uh, it's actually the Space Command, which is not the Space Force, uh, in the form of uh, element sets that are in the public catalog. Um, there are some limited data sets, and, and one of the most interesting things, I think, sort of sobering things that have come out in the last decade is that even if we do passivate our satellites that are in the geosynchronous region and we move them out to what we call a graveyard, so we raise their altitude so that it's kind of safe distance away from our operational zone, um, something like material degradation and, and these exotic, you know, non-gravitational forces, something called Yurkovsky acceleration pressure, uh, Yorp effect, things that can rotate, spin up these spacecraft, these zombie Kind of satellites in the graveyard, and they could shed these very high air to mass ratio uh, debris. Uh, and these are being tracked again by NASA. So some of that data has been has been used in some of my research. Um, but uh, I, in general, um, a lot of the things I do is uh, pretty theoretical and computational. So uh, tries to com combine theory, observation, and, and simulation, sort of. Um, yeah. Holistically. Yeah, well, well, as we wrap up this show, we actually got one question in from Harry that, you know, of course, is going to be a tough question to answer. Um, but, you know, Alyssa, maybe give your best sort of answer to what the consequences of of polluting is. As, as, so the question from Harry is, is, what are the consequences of polluting space? Which, of course, is a very broad question. Um, it's a tough one to answer, but um, uh, give us a give it a shot. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, that, that is a tough, a tough question to answer. And I mean, I guess going back to Don Kessler, who sort of originated this idea of well, the, the Kessler syndrome, where we get to the point where there are too many uh, debris objects created to safely operate in, in space anymore. Um, I mean, that's the, that's the ultimate hazard, mm. right, is we can no longer launch satellites safely um, to where they can operate for their intended purpose and for their intended duration. Um, and every every satellite that's launched, it just wants to go do its mission, do its thing and, and be able to collect whatever data it's trying to collect in, in a safe way. And so that's you know the ultimate hazard is that they're no longer able to do that, whether it's because um, there's no safe place to operate anymore or because they um, there's too much risk from collision with objects that would be mission ending. Um, that type of thing. I don't know if that really answers the question, but again, <laughs> well, no, tough yeah, question. Yeah, it ventures us into this realm, which of course, uh, I think with all of the big challenges of, of our planet, global warming, these are things that every country and human, you know, um, is a part of because it affects all of us, right? And this is why space is always talked about as the, the grand unifier because um, all of these issues, whether it's just one country doing it, but everyone on this planet is gonna be affected by it, which is why, you know, when we're talking about, you know, these issues, these are global issues um, and why space does become this place where countries do kind of need to work together, whether, all, you know, forgetting about all the political complications, there is, you know, this um, this need um, just for the sake of humanity um, to to find some solutions uh, for these problems. Um, Alyssa and Aaron, uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for another Space Debris Day. It was a, it was a quick one. Um, if you're out there watching on YouTube or on Facebook and you have more questions, you can always email uh, us, um, uh, info at uh, Space Center, and we'll, uh, Marley and I will answer uh, all of your questions. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much. Hopefully we'll see you again uh, next year uh, if you're still down in San Diego. Um, Alyssa, um, hopefully, I, I've never been to Houston, but I hope to, uh, to visit someday. Uh, there's lots of fun space things to, to visit there. Yes. If you do come in the spring, the summer is not ideal. <laughs> awesome. All right, everyone. We will be live again in uh, two weeks. That is going to be February the 23rd, uh, where our theme is going to be Red in the Universe. Uh, we've got a Valentine's event uh, coming up next week. We've got a brand new series um, all talking about red shift. What does red mean in the universe? Well, tune in in two weeks, February 23rd, 4 p.m. Pacific time. We will see you all then. Bye for now. Um, so I'm just waiting on uh, restream here. You can you could probably go if you wanted, Marley. I'm not going to shut down the stream until I see restream done. Oh, okay. Alyssa has the coolest job ever. <laughs> well, her job. Could be done. Well, there you go. I mean, I'll send you the bio if you want to follow. I found uh, her. I was on. That's why I didn't share my slide. I was on her website. Like I was literally looking at the institution she works for, looking at the data. So I was like, she talks about it. I'm not going to do okay. it. But anyways, see you. Bye.